Sometimes you get to hinge points in human history, moments when we have to choose between an exuberant descent into lunacy and a still sober voice offering us the same way out. Usually, we can only see these hinge points when we look back from a distance. In 1793, the great Democrat Thomas Paine said the French Revolution shouldn't betray its principles by killing the former king because it would trigger an orgy of bloodletting that would eventually drown them all. They threw him in jail. In 1919, the great economist John Maynard Keynes said that the European powers shouldn't humiliate Germany because it would catalyse extreme nationalism and produce another world war. They ignored him. In 1953, a handful of the American president Dwight Eisenhower's advisers urged him not to destroy Iranian democracy by kidnapping its prime minister because it would have a reactionary ripple effect that lasted decades. They refused to listen. Another of these seemingly small moments with a long echo is, I think, happening now. A marginalised voice is offering us a quiet warning and an inspiring way to save ourselves. Yet this positive alternative seems to be passing unheard in the night. It's coming from the people of Ecuador, led by their elected president, Rafael Correa, and it would begin to deal with two converging crises. In the four billion years since life began on Earth, there have been five times when there was a sudden mass extinction of life forms. The last time was 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs were killed, probably by a meteor. But now, the world's scientists agree, the sixth mass extinction is at hand. Humans have accelerated the rate of species extinction by a factor of at least 100, and the great Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson is warning it could reach a factor of 10,000 within the next 20 years. We're doing this largely by stripping species of their habitat. We're destroying the planet's biodiversity, and so we are making the natural chains that keep us all alive much more vulnerable to collapse. This time, we are the meteor. At the same time, we're dramatically warming the atmosphere. Yeah, I know it's become terribly passé to listen to virtually all the world's scientists on this issue, but I remember the collapsing glaciers I saw when I reported from the Arctic, the drying out I saw in Darfur, and the rising saltwater I saw in Bangladesh. 2010 was the joint hottest year ever recorded, according to NASA. The best scientific prediction is that we're now on course for a three feet rise in global sea levels this century. That means goodbye London, goodbye Cairo, goodbye Bangkok, goodbye Venice, goodbye Shanghai. Doubt it if you want, but the US National Academy of Sciences, which is the most distinguished scientific body in the world, just found that 97% of scientific experts agree with the evidence for man-made global warming. The tiny 3% who disagreed had average expertise in their field far below their colleagues. So where does Ecuador come in? At the tip of this South American country, there lies 4,000 lush square miles of rainforest where the Amazon Basin, the Andes Mountains and the equator come together. It's the most biodiverse place on Earth. When scientists studied a single hectare of it, They found it had more different species of tree than the whole of North America put together. It holds the world records for different species of amphibians, reptiles and bats. And more more importantly still, this rainforest is a crucial part of the planet's lungs, inhaling huge amounts of heat-trapping gases and keeping them out of the atmosphere. But almost all the pressure from the outside world today is to saw it down. Why? Because underneath that rainforest... There's almost a billion barrels of untapped oil, containing 400 million tonnes of planet cooking gases. We crave it. We howl for it. We'll do anything for it. Unlike biodiversity and a safe climate, it's tradable for cash. Here's a textbook example of what's driving both the sixth great extinction and global warming. We have been putting short-term profits for a few ahead of the long-term needs of our species. And we know this is causing a disaster. But the oil companies push on in search of profit and they pull the rest of us in their trail. Except this time, for the first time, the people of Ecuador are offering us an alternative, a way to break this pattern. Alberto Acosta the former energy minister who drew up the plan, calls it a punto de ruptura, a turning point, 
one that questions the logic of extractive development that drilled us into this species-swallowing hole. Here's the offer. The oil beneath the rainforest is worth about $7 billion. Everyone knows that a stable climate, biodiversity and functioning lungs are worth much more than that. But until now, no one's been willing to pay. Ecuador's democratic government says that over the next 10 years, if the rest of the world offers just half of what the oil is worth, $3.5 billion, uh, $3.5 billion they will keep the rainforest standing and alive and working for all of us. This will almost certainly, just to give you some sense of perspective, be less than the current Libya war will cost us. In a country where 38% live in poverty and 13% are on the brink of starvation, this is an incredibly generous offer and one that's popular in the rainforest itself. As one of its residents, Julia Kada, who's 45, told New Internationalist magazine, with oil, the government just sells it to richer countries and we're left with nothing, no birds or animals or trees. No country with oil has ever done anything like this before. Not a single one has ever considered leaving it in the ground because the consequences of digging it up are too disastrous. This is a startling attempt to reverse one of the great dysfunctions in the current global economic system. The market considers things like species diversity, the climate and the rainforest to be externalities, factors that are not affected by the price and profit mechanisms, so irrelevant and dispensable. It's a system that, as Oscar Wilde puts it, knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. The people of Ecuador are trying to find a way to get us to see the value of some of the most important things on earth. They first made this offer in 2006. So, how has the world responded? Chile offered $100,000. Spain offered $1.4 million. Germany initially offered $50 million, then pulled out. Now President Correa is warming, warning they can't wait forever in a country where 13% are close to starving. If they don't have $100 million in the pot by the end of this year, he says they've got no choice but to pursue plan B, the digging and destruction of the rainforest. If one rainforest seems a small matter to you, remember that the head of one deposed French king, the punishment of one broken country, and the deposing of one Iranian prime minister seemed pretty minor ones. But they rippled out, and they shaped history for centuries. This too could be a moment where, when it's viewed with the perspective of decades or centuries, human history branches into two directions. On the path to the right, we turn down the chance to restrain ourselves, and we decide with a shrug to burn all the oil left in the world's soils and hack down all the remaining rainforests. Professor James Hansen, the NASA climatologist who has consistently been proved right about global warming, has explained where this ends. Quote, Clearly, if we burn all fossil fuels, we'll destroy the planet we know. We would set the planet on a course to the ice-free state, with a sea level 75 metres higher than it is now. Coastal disasters would occur continually. The only uncertainty is the time it would take for complete ice sheet disintegration. End quote. But there's another path where we choose to protect humanity's habitat and are prepared to pay for it. If our governments won't accept this offer at this late stage in these ecological crises, what are they saying about themselves and what are they saying about us?